This video concerns the events in Ukraine, especially the history being used by Putin to justify the invasion of Ukraine. As a historian that also happens to be from Eastern Europe, or Central Europe depending on how you choose to define it, I have in recent weeks been asked on numerous occasions by friends, family and strangers to explain the historical statements made by Putin to justify his war. Many other historians have lately been in the same position and therefore I think it would be prudent to make a quick video addressing all of this, to help convey some basic facts about Ukrainian and Russian history and to show how these facts are being altered by Putin to fit his agenda. In 2021, Putin wrote an essay titled On the Historical Unity of Russians and Ukrainians, which, to summarize, basically gave multiple historical justifications to the idea that Ukrainians are Russians and Ukraine belongs with Russia. This goes hand in hand with his previous statements about Ukraine in 2014 or with his various speeches in 2022. The idea that Ukrainians and Russians are basically the same people is by far not a new one and it had existed in nationalistic Russia and circles in one way or another for centuries. To explain all of this, however, one has to start with the polity that all modern Eastern Slavic nations trace their national, and often ethnic, origins to, the Kievan Rus. The Kievan Rus was an early medieval Eastern European polity existing roughly from the late 9th century centered around the city of Kiev. I have already addressed the formation and history of the Kievan Rus in my video on early East Slavic history, so I won't talk about it in detail here. But the important factor to comment on here is that it would be wholly inappropriate appropriate to talk of the Kievan Rus as Russian or Ukrainian or purely Slavic. The Kievan Rus, just like many early medieval polities, was a multi-ethnic kingdom composed of many different people groups. There were Vikings from today's Sweden called Varangians, there were various Finno-Ugric tribes, various Euro-Asian, Turkic, Iranian and other nomadic tribes, there was a Jewish community of traders and even the various Eastern Slavic tribes, which were the majority population of the Kievan Rus, saw themselves as different from each other. There did not exist some kind of a universal Eastern Slavic kinship. Slavic tribes were just as likely to fight each other as they were to fight other people. Kievan Rus would eventually fall in the first half of the 13th century due to internal fracturing and power struggles and external invasion by the Mongols. Therefore, speaking of the Kievan Rus as anything else than the product of its time, a kingdom of many, often bickering Eastern Slavic tribes, a kingdom comprised of multitude of different peoples, a kingdom which slowly fractured apart and was conquered by the Mongols, would be inappropriate if not outright wrong. In the 14th century, and a bit in the 15th century, most of what is today's Ukraine, including Kiev, was conquered by Poland and Lithuania. For the next roughly 400 years, these lands evolved and developed in culture, language, art, etc. under Polish and Lithuanian control. During the same time, the Mongols, or as they came to be known in Eastern Europe, the Golden Horde, remained in control roughly east of the Dnieper Bend. Here, the Mongols exerted power over the local population and enforced tribute payments from the various local towns and villages. One of these towns was the wooden trading post on the banks of the Moskva River, known as Moscow. Moscow over time became the center of an increasingly powerful principality which bore the name of its capital city, Muscovy. Muscovy eventually grew more powerful than their Mongol overlords and through a series of conflicts became independent in 1480. From there, Muscovy grew more and more powerful with ever-expanding military conquests. With this expansion, Muscovy began to style itself more and more as a kingdom of not a Rus people, but of the the Rus people. To explain, since the time of the Kievan Rus, the word Rus was just used to identify all Eastern Slavs. It wasn't supposed to denote any single Slavic peoples, it was used just as a classification for all Eastern Slavic people. In essence, the words Eastern Slavs today are used the same way the word Rus was used back then. So Muscovy's increasing styling of itself as the nation of all the Rus meant that they began to create an idea that all Eastern Slavs belong under their control. This is evident, for example, when in the 16th century Ivan the Terrible, following his grandfather's footsteps, assumed the title of Tsar and Grand Duke of all Rus. No longer was Muscovy just Muscovy, a duchy of a single Rus peoples. It was now the Tsardom of Russia, literally meaning the empire of all Rus people, or, in other words, all Eastern Slavs. 
This way, the country that over time just became known as Russia could start to justify wars with their western neighbors in the name of unifying all the Rus. Even if all the Rus, or all Eastern Slavs, did not and still do not see themselves as the same people, just like, for example, all Western Germanic speakers don't necessarily see themselves as all the same people. By Muscovy styling itself as a polity of all the Rus, as Russia, or Russia, it harkened back to the kingdom of the Kievan Rus and its historical borders. Muscovite Russia went to great lengths to try to convince people of Kievan Rus Moscow Russian continuity, even though, as we discussed, talking about the Kievan Rus in any other context than it being a product of its time which got conquered by the Mongols would be wholly inaccurate. So when Putin talks of Ukraine as a place where Russia began on account of the Kievan Rus, and therefore should be part of today's Russia, he's talking about the made-up Moscovite Russian concept that regards modern Russia as the successor to the Kievan Rus, which has no actual basis in history. Early modern Russia, slowly, in multiple wars and partitions between the mid-17th and early 19th century, conquered most, but not all, the lands of today's Ukraine and Belarus away from the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Russia was hoping to assimilate all these newly conquered Eastern Slavs into their idealized pan-Russian nation, despite many of these Eastern Slavs often having a different language to the Muscovite Russians, different culture and different customs, as they were influenced by the Poles, Lithuanians and overall more Western ideology for centuries. These people were still Eastern Slavs, and they still saw themselves as the Rus, but not as Muscovite Rus, or, in other words, as Russians. Therefore, when Putin in his speech on the 21st of February 2022 stated that, for a long time, the inhabitants of the historical lands of the southwest of ancient Russia called themselves Russians and Orthodox. This was the case until the 17th century, when part of these territories were reunified with the Russian state. He is wrong. These people identified as the Rus, as the Eastern Slavs, but not as Russians, and ever since the word the Rus got appropriated by the Muscovite Russians, the people living in today's Ukraine had to start using other identifiers, like for example, Ukrainians. The name of Ukraine existed far before this time, but it was around this time it got more widely adopted due to the appropriation of the name Rus by the people from Muscovy, by the Russians. Despite all these factors, Russia tried very hard, through Russification, to assimilate all the Eastern Slavs into what they called the Obshehruski Narod, meaning one Russian peoples. To them, all the Eastern Slavs, all the Rus, were the same people, and, therefore, they should all be talking and acting as the the same people. In some areas, this Russification proved to be successful. For example, almost all Ukrainian high nobility assimilated into the Russian aristocracy by the 19th century. However, in other areas, this Russification backfired, and in opposition to it, during the late 18th and 19th century, Ukrainian national consciousness consolidated more thoroughly and Ukrainian language was officially codified by Ukrainian intellectuals. The continued survival of this Ukrainian national consciousness in the 19th century proved extremely problematic to the Russian government. The Russian Minister of Interior, P. A. Valuev, said in 1876 that, permitting the creation of a special literature for the common people in the Ukrainian dialect would signify in collaborating in the alienation of Ukraine from the rest of Russia. To permit the separation of 13 million little Russians, that is what the Russians called Ukrainians, would be the utmost political irresponsibility, especially in view of the unifying movement which is proceeding alongside us among the German tribes. In heed of this warning, the Tsar forbade all, with very few exceptions, literary publications and teaching in Ukrainian. The Russian Empire also conducted a series of forced relocations and sometimes violent suppression of Ukrainian people. Many Ukrainian thinkers, therefore, fled to Western Ukraine, which was part of the Habsburg monarchy. Here, Ukrainian culture and language wasn't suppressed as much, and, in fact, it was seen by the Austrians as a beneficial counterbalance to the Poles living in Austria. Therefore, much of Ukrainian literature of the late 19th century came from Western Ukraine, and this literature was often smuggled into Russian-controlled Ukraine, which continued to be under harsh Russification pressure well into the First World War. The Russian Empire lost 
lost the First World War, and in the aftermath of this loss, Russia fell into civil war. Putin, again in his 21st of February speech, stated that modern Ukraine was fully and completely created by Russia, more precisely, Bolshevik and Communist Russia. This process began almost immediately after the revolution of 1917, and Lenin and his associates did it in a way that was extremely harsh on Russia, separating, uprooting part of its own historical territories. Nobody asked the millions of people living there what they thought. Now, taking aside the fact that, as we discussed, Ukrainians and Ukrainian identity existed far before 1917, some key events did happen during this time and they did not happen the way Putin described them. When Russia lost the First World War to the Central Powers in 1917, most of the area of what is today Ukraine fell under the control of the Germans and Austro-Hungarians. However, these countries never really had time to consolidate power in this region and both soon surrendered to the Allies. Therefore, there was a large power vacuum in Ukraine and so many different factions started to vie for control. The most successful of these factions was the Ukrainian People's Republic, established by the Ukrainian Directorate. The Ukrainian People's Republic would, in 1920, symbolically unify with the West Ukrainian People's Republic, which was established in the Ukrainian lands formerly controlled by Austria-Hungary. This idea of a finally unified Ukrainian state, however, never really came to fruition, as the Ukrainians who sought independence had to fight many other groups, like Ukrainians who didn't want independence, or Poles, or White Russians, or the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, which was created and supported by the Russian Bolshevik etc. This entire complicated situation ended in the 1920s when the West Ukrainian People's Republic was conquered by the Poles and the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, with the help from the Russian Bolsheviks, won the Ukrainian Civil War against the Ukrainian People's Republic and other Ukrainian factions. As you can see, Ukraine wasn't created by Lenin in 1917. There were genuine tries to form an independent state of Ukraine in the post-war period, which, in the end, failed on account of the Bolsheviks. Nobody asked the millions of people living there what they thought because what many of them thought was that they wanted an independent Ukraine. The mere fact that Lenin, along with the Bolsheviks, established the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic shows just how different Ukrainians were to the Russians. The Russian Bolsheviks simply couldn't have controlled Ukraine by merely annexing it. The Bolsheviks had to establish and support an internal Bolshevik movement within Ukraine in order to gain control of it. After after winning the Ukrainian Civil War with the help from the Red Army, the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic joined the USSR. The way the new Russian Soviet state was going to be run was a matter of strong debate among the Bolsheviks. In the end, a federative solution was chosen. In accordance with this solution, a People's Commissariat of Nationalities, or just Narkomnats for short, was created, whose job was to make the most accurate federal divisions within the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, or just the USSR for short. It is this body that Putin refers to when he talks about what was the point of transferring to the newly, often arbitrarily formed administrative units, the Union Republics, vast territories that had nothing to do with them. But this is inaccurate. As Goffrey Hoskin states in his book Russia and the Russians, they, the Narkomnats, drew on censuses, historical studies, and ethnographic, geographic, and linguistic surveys to try to determine as accurately as possible the ethnic composition and degree of the national development of the territories over which the Soviet state was assuming sovereignty. They were definitely not creating arbitrarily formed administrative units. With that said, as Lenin died and Stalin took control over the USSR, things changed. For one, a more direct centralization of power occurred and the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic, or just Russia for short, which was the largest and most dominant political power in the USSR, came to, for all intents and purposes, dominate the whole of the USSR and all of its other constituents. In the context of centralizing power, in Ukraine specifically, Stalin's infamous purges often targeted the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic as one of his principal aims was to disrupt ethnic patriotism systems and break down the local resistance to orders from Moscow. 
On top of that, his economic reforms caused one of the worst famines in history called the Holodomor, which disproportionately affected minorities in the USSR like the Ukrainians, Kazakhs, Tatars, etc. There were also many killings, imprisonments and forced resettlements of Ukrainians who refused to comply with the Soviet state. The Western Ukrainians in Poland were faring slightly better than their Eastern counterparts, but not by a lot. Ukrainians were often looked down upon by the Poles, especially after Poland had to fight the West Ukrainian People's Republic over land which the Poles deemed as rightfully theirs. Due to this negative Ukrainian sentiment in Poland, many laws were created that hindered Ukrainian social development and resettled Polish farmers in areas populated by a Ukrainian majority. All this resulted in that, when World War II started and the Nazis began to occupy Eastern Europe, Ukrainians welcomed the Germans as their liberators. Putin referred to this in his declaration of war speech, stating that they will undoubtedly try to bring war to Crimea just as they have done to Donbas, to kill innocent people just as members of the punitive units of Ukrainian nationalists and Hitler's accomplices did during the Great Patriotic War. This statement, again, is not completely true. Yes, Ukrainians did initially welcome the Germans as liberators, and yes, there were Ukrainians who collaborated and helped the Nazis, but that isn't the full picture. For one, every occupied country in Europe had some Nazi collaborators. The French, the Slovaks, the Czechs, the Poles, even though they like to deny it, and even the Russians all had Nazi collaborators. However, these collaborators do not represent the majority of the population in these countries. The initial Ukrainian sentiment towards the Germans as their liberators quickly faded away as it became clear that the Nazis saw the Ukrainians, along with other Slavs, as inferior human beings, as Untermenschen. Reichskommissar Erich Koch, who was in charge of governing occupied Ukraine, stated, there is no such thing as a free Ukraine. Our aim is to ensure that Ukrainians work for Germany. To this aim, able-bodied men and women, including adolescents, were rounded up and deported to work as slaves in German factories and mines. Anyone who resisted was publicly hanged as an example. Several million citizens of the occupied regions of the USSR worked for or collaborated with the Germans, either as soldiers or as civilians, but that was usually because the alternative was violent death. Many Ukrainians became sick of being occupied by the Poles, the Russians and the Nazis and formed partisan groups which at their height consisted of over 100,000 people. These partisan groups were often loosely unified, as some groups waged guerrilla warfare against all occupiers like Poles, Soviets and Germans, while others collaborated with one of these factions against the other ones. Flip-flopping between the factions was also not uncommon. The goal of all these partisan groups was to create, in one way or another, some kind of an independent state of Ukraine. To achieve this goal, they fought with sometimes inexcusable brutality with some partisan groups conducting ethnic cleansing. Some of these partisan groups continued to operate after the war ended, fighting well into the 1950s. So when Putin stated in his declaration of war speech that the people living in territories which are part of today's Ukraine were not asked how they want to build their lives when the USSR was created or after World War II, they were not asked because they didn't want to be part of the USSR. In both instances, as we saw, there was active military opposition to Russia and other countries. After the Second World War ended, Ukraine was subject to harsh crackdowns by the Soviets including imprisonments, killings, deportations, etc. as they retaliated against the actions of the Ukrainian partisans. When it comes to Crimea, this area was historically inhabited by the Tatars, a Turkic language speaking peoples. However, by the end of World War II, they were dubiously charged with supporting the Nazis and were either killed or deported to mostly Kazakhstan. The depopulated Crimea was then resettled by some Ukrainians, but mostly Russians. So when Putin talks of Crimea as being Russian, it's only Russian because most of its indigenous Tatar population was killed or deported. Crimea was originally under Russian control, but it was then given to Ukraine in 1954 by Khrushchev. There are multiple reasons as to why Khrushchev gave Crimea to Ukraine, but ultimately the most important factor was that it did not matter. Crimea was still in the USSR, just under slightly different administration. As William Tubman states, Khrushchev never even thought of future ramifications of such a decision as he most likely couldn't have imagined the future where Ukraine would not be part of some kind of a Russian state. 
With all that said, after the death of Stalin, the Cold War period finally brought some relief to Ukraine. This is not to say that Russification efforts went away, no, but they did become more passive. For example, like giving preferential treatment in the government or the workplace to Russian speakers over Ukrainian speakers. Active Russification, like the aforementioned resettlements of Ukrainians, became largely a thing of the past. Although, with that said, any kind of formation of nationalistic Ukrainian movement movements during this time was still harshly cracked down upon. Ukraine during this time also saw large-scale industrialization. This industrialization was often followed with an influx of Russian migrant workers, mostly to cities like Kyiv, Luhansk, Kharkiv, etc. This, along with the centuries-long Russification efforts, meant that Ukraine, by 1990, had a sizable native Russian-speaking population. Native Russian-speaking, however, did not, and still does not, always mean Russian-identifying. There are plenty of native Russian speakers in Ukraine that identify as Ukrainians, I personally know one of them, and the majority of Ukrainians can speak Russian. By one 2010 poll, 76% of Ukrainian citizens could speak Russian despite only around 17.2% of citizens identifying as Russians. When it came to breaking up of the USSR, the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, under pressure from its citizens, declared independence in August of 1991. That same year, in December, the new country of just Ukraine held an independence referendum. The voter turnout was 84.2%, and out of those people, 92.3% voted for independence. There wasn't a single county, or oblast, that had an anti-independence majority. Even Crimea, the oblast blast with the largest percentage of native Russian speakers voted in favor of independence with a voter turnout of 60%. On top of that, Ukraine along with USA, UK and Russia signed the Budapest Memorandum in 1994. This treaty guaranteed to the new country of Ukraine that the other signatory countries reaffirmed their commitment to Ukraine to respect the independence and sovereignty and the existing borders of Ukraine, and that they also reaffirmed their obligation to refer from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of Ukraine and that none of their weapons will ever be used against Ukraine. All of this in exchange for Ukraine giving up its nuclear weapons which it inherited after the breakup of the USSR. This treaty was obviously broken in 2014 and is definitely broken now. With that said, this newfound independence did not mean Ukraine was completely leaving Russia behind. Ukraine still remained a close ally of Russia for the next couple of decades. However, a slow change started to happen in the 21st century. A large majority of Ukrainian people increasingly started to look westwards while some Ukrainians, and especially Russian leaders, wanted Ukraine to remain a close ally of Russia, just like Belarus did. These divisions of opinion then led to all the events that occurred in 2014 and are happening now. Lastly, I will talk about language in Ukraine. The language laws that have been adopted by Ukraine since the 2014 crisis have been swayed by increasing Ukrainian nationalistic sentiment. The threat of Russia in the 2014 crisis made Ukraine rethink its quite bilingual stance on the Russian and Ukrainian languages. After all, as stated before, 76% of all Ukrainians could speak Russian, and Russian was still sometimes used by ethnic Ukrainians for communication. However, However, the increasing threat of Russia to Ukraine made the use of Russian fall out of favor and, therefore, its language status became increasingly sidelined in favor of Ukrainian. With three controversial language bills passing in 2014, 2017 and 2019. Despite Putin's claim to protect people who have been subject to bullying and genocide by the Kiev regime, especially as he refers to the language laws, this is not the case. The language laws were harsh, and that's why their passing to law was controversial, but they by no means are causing a genocide or an active eradication of Russian, or any other minority language in Ukraine. Russian, along with 17 other languages, is still a recognized minority language in Ukraine and as such it can still be taught in schools, used for plays, newspapers, music, books, etc. It just can't no longer do that in place of Ukrainian, meaning news sites in Russian will also have to have a Ukrainian version, schools teaching Russian will have to also teach Ukrainian, and, perhaps most controversial, 
students are only given the right to study the language of the respective indigenous people rather than in the language of their minority. With that said, other things like theater shows can remain in Russian or any other minority language, and minority language bookstores can operate just as normal. In the end, yes, the language laws are harsh, and there was a backlash against them in Ukraine and in neighboring countries, but they are not genocide by the Kiev regime. People can still teach these minority languages and can even ask for funding from the Kiev government to do so. The people who are actually oppressed the most by Ukrainian language laws aren't Russians, but Rusins living in Transcarpathia. This is because despite the Rusin being recognized as a minority language in most Eastern European countries, in Ukraine it is only seen as a Ukrainian dialect and, therefore, not worthy of a minority language status. So, unlike Russian, it does not get the privilege of publishing its own books, teaching its own classes, printing its own newspapers, etc. As Alain Rusinko states, today in Ukraine, Rusin newspapers do not enjoy any support from the government, unlike the publications of many other national minorities, and Rusins are not even allowed to establish Saturday or Sunday schools where they might be taught their own language and culture, unlike other minority languages in Ukraine. What is interesting here is that Putin, in his paper on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians, did mention Rusins as distinct from Ukrainians and allegedly even supports Rusin independence movements. But all of this is purely a political play by Putin, and the goal of all Rusin movements at the moment is not to secede from Ukraine, but to restore autonomous status within its framework. In the end, Ukraine is not a saint. Ironically, there are no saints in history, but all the historical statements used by Putin as propaganda to justify the current war are, as shown, historically inaccurate. Putin's statement of, I think that the Russian and Ukrainian peoples are practically one single people, peddles centuries-old Russian propaganda of a unified Rus people, despite such a thing never existing in history. To anyone who has been affected or knows people who have been affected by the war in Ukraine and are trying to escape to neighboring countries, in the description of this video I have tried to give as many links and phone numbers to Polish, Slovak, Romanian, etc. organizations that are trying to help all Ukrainian refugees. Hopefully this video was helpful in dispelling some of the falsehoods out there about the history of the Ukrainian and Russian relations. Of course, this video could not have been all-encompassing, but I tried to at least address all the major points. As always, there's more information and corrections in the pinned comment. You can also download my scripts for free on Patreon, which have all the sources in it. This video is not monetized, because I didn't want it to be. However, this video, along with all the other videos on my channel, has been brought to you with the support of my kind patrons. Special thanks to this month's deity to your patron, Daniel Garza. As always, my name is Emlazer, and stick around for history.